Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Love in the Time of Ruins. Um, I'm Donna Hill. I will be your host and the moderator for this afternoon. And I am pleased, excited, thrilled to be with three people that I know and love personally. Um, so this is like old home week for us. So <laughs> if we just kind of like go off and start talking about something crazy, don't mind us because we're, we're, it's all good and it's all, we're all friends. So I want to um, start us off. I want to introduce um, our panel today. Um, and I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. So there's, you know, there's nothing personal about Wayne Jordan going last. <laughs> um, so um, <laughs> Rochelle Allers has been hailed by readers and booksellers alike as one of today's most prolific and popular African-American authors of romance and women's fiction. With more than 80 titles and nearly 2 million copies of her novels in print, Rochelle is a regular on bestsellers list and has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Emma Award, the Vivian Stevens Award for Excellence in Romance, the Romantic Times Career Achievement Award, and the Zora Neale Hurston Literary Award. Um, she works full time as a writer, lucky girl. Um, and she lives yeah. in the charming hamlet of Long Island. I just love the word hamlet because I'm just like, oh, okay. That's just we, really we only had 1,900 people. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> I think so I had that many people on my block, you know? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right, so that's my girl, Rochelle. We go back, 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 way back. Um, and next up is Miss Beverly Jenkins. And she is the nation's premier writer of African-American historical romance fiction. Like everybody that does anything to do with romant romantic um, uh, historical fiction knows Beverly Jenkins. Um, so she specializes in 19th century African-American life. She's the 2018 Michigan Library Association Author of the Year, a USA Today bestselling author, and an NAACP Image Award nominee, and the 2017 recipient of Romance Writers of America, Nora Roberts Lifetime Achievement Award. Now, that's a long name for an award, but well-deserved, Beverly. <laughs> um, she has over 49 published works and has been mm -hmm. named many best books of the year list, including NPR and the American Library Association. Uh, she speaks widely on romance, writing, and African American history. Welcome. Beverly. Thanks for having me. All her, friends, all, her, all her friends and followers call her Miss Bev. Miss <laughs> Bev. Miss <laughs> <Ms>. Bev. <laughs> I and I am totally thrilled to have Wayne Jordan here because. Whereas, you know, Beverly and Rochelle are quasi local in terms of, you know, where people are. Wayne is like way where we want to be in the Bahamas, <laughs> in, in Barbados. Yes. So he lives on the tropical island of Barbados, which is known for its shimmering clear waters and golden sands, which we could all use some of right Ooh. now. Um, he's a high school teacher who dreamed about becoming an author. In 2003, after winning the Heart and Soul Aspiring Authors Contest, um, an editor at the then BET Books, Demetria Lucas, read and signed him to a two book contract. Capture the Sunrise was released in November 2005 as part of a two in one volume, Slow Motion. Since then, he has published several books with Harlequin Enterprises. Wayne is a high school teacher of English Lit I bow to you because I'm yeah. a teacher of English Lit as well. Um, communications and Theater Arts and holds a BA in English and Linguistics and an MA in Applied Linguistics. Um, he's always been an advocate for romance, in particular um, romances that feature heroes and heroines of color. Um, he's the owner and founder of RomanceandColor.com, a website which promotes African American romance and its authors. And I definitely want Wayne to talk a little bit about um, that site, why it's so important to us, especially now um, as we get into our discussions a little bit later. Um, so, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, Hi. You know, Hi. Hi. Take this easy. Um, but before we get into sort of, um, you know, the, the, the weeds of 
everything that I want to talk about today. Um, I just would like to ask, like, why romance? Um, romance traditionally, um, so so we're sort of the stepchildren of romance, of, of writing, of literature, right? Everybody, oh, all they think is body strippers. Oh, it's just, you know, a whole lot of sex scenes. And it's, you know, it's this, it's that, and it's formulaic. Um, but romance has been around since the 18th century, right? It's been sustained. Um, it is one of the most popular forms of fiction, period, across the board. And it just stays that way. Um, but of all of the choices that you could have made in terms of becoming a writer, why the romance genre? So, and Wayne, I'd really like to start with you because we always think that women are romance writers, right? Um, but why did why did you select that genre? Um, when I when I was growing up as a as a teenager, um, a lot of my relatives, most of them were female. And I liked reading a lot. And after running out of the books that I liked, there were always there was always romance novels around. And um, when I first started reading, it was more reading because I liked reading. And I was a real fan of geography. And a lot of the mills and booms that we had in those times took me to those places that I've only read about, heard about at school, but never really knew. And so for me, it was, it started out as a learning process. And then over the years, I found that I liked them. And um, it's a, 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 a relationship that I've had for almost 40 years now. I still, I still consider romance to be my, my favorite genre. Of course, I, I write in that genre. Um, I, I like suspense too, but I always mm -hmm. find myself going back to, to romance. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my, romance is my number one genre. And I think, especially when you think of life as it is now and relationships, it is not often that we get the happily ever after. Yeah. And, rom and romance still does that. Especially when you see in your, in real life, so many people breaking up. And I think that love pulls people together. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm always amazed when I see relationships that last a long time. So within my books, at least I can put my characters in a situation when they have a happy ever after. Mm -hmm. Cool, very good. Yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, having <laughs> that, I think all of us, regardless as to, you know, what we do, we want to see that happy ending, that mm -hmm. happily ever after. And even though, you know, romance readers know that that's what they're going to get, it's the getting there. It's you know? the getting there. That's, that's, that's the, it's the yeah. getting there. You know, like, well, how are they going to get through this? You know, it just seems impossible. Um, so what about you, Rochelle? Why, why romance for you? Because you go, you go way back, too, in terms of, like, one of the early, early writers of the genre. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when I always was a reader and then my, I have an aunt who was a teacher and her, she would read like Frank Yerby and I was really too young to understand a lot of it, but the character, the main characters were white, but they, he always had, I mean, he said it in like the antebellum South and being mm -hmm. a black man himself, he always gave the, the slaves dignity, you know? So I, you know, I started reading that. And I think I started reading books that were really above my comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was reading uh, Frank G. Slaughter, who wrote a lot of historical type books. I mean, I, this is way back when I was, I don't even think I was a teenager. And then I started reading Harold Robbins and, and you know, they had the love scenes and I, of course I hadn't experienced it. So I would skip over that, but it was just the relationships because even with these big sagas, it was always the relationships. And usually, um, you know, it was a journey. It became a journey. And, you know, did they stay together or did they not have the happily ever after? But when I discovered silhouette romances, one day, I, was, I think I was in a Woolworth and they had a bunch of them on a rack. 
And I didn't, I started to read the Harlequins because I think Red Book used to do excerpts of Harlequins in their magazine. Wow, that's I, way back, I'm back Rochelle. You, I, 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 <laughs> Red from Book. the time I learned to read, I would read everything, including the cereal box. So, you know, mm -hmm. I would try to read those, those, those excerpts, but the culture was a little bit different in, in the language. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't realize when they said it took a lift and I didn't realize it was an elevator and they said the boot of the car. And I'm saying, what is that? It took me a while to learn. That's the trunk of the car. So, <laughs> you know, I, I stopped reading the Mills and Boone's Harlequin. So when the silhouettes came out, they were based in the United States. They were North, truly North American. And I picked up, I think, six, and then I realized they were numbered. So I went back and got, you know, in sequence, and I started reading them, and it's like, it was so easy to read. It was just so easy. To, it's like, I love popcorn, so I know what popcorn's supposed to taste like. And these romances, I knew what they were supposed to, they were supposed to be. And then, you know, the, it's like, I know these two people are going to end up with each other. So it was the predictability. So for the two hours that I would sit down and read that book, it was it was almost like a flight of fancy, even though I didn't realize these were kind of delusional because they went through all this stuff and then they ended up happy. And I just, it was like, it, I became addicted. I truly became addicted to romances. And I decided these are so easy to read I can write one of these, not realizing mm -hmm. how difficult it is to write because it's a formula. And yeah, when you have yeah. to write, you cannot color outside the lines when you may want to. You know, yeah. it's like that's that's when it hit me to say, you know, this is this is a lot harder to write than it is to read. Yeah. And, but, I, and I don't think that um people outside of the genre understand the level of difficulty that it takes to write a romance for all of those reasons and then some. Mm -hmm. um, you're writing about relationships, yes, but at the same time, um, you have to, like you were saying, Rochelle, you have to, you know, this is a, certain things are supposed to take place regardless mm -hmm. as to whatever else is going on. And then like for me, there's only so many love scenes that you can write this new. Thank you. <laughs> so it's like, okay, which way can they do it this time? You know what I mean? And that's like really difficult. But um, on that note, I wanna I wanna ask Beverly because Bev, you um, you know, why you write romance, you incorporate all of this history. So why did you start off with romance anyway? What was what was your entree? Um, as an avid reader, just like everybody else, um, read everything. Um, I was the kid that, that read everything in the neighborhood library from the children's books to the adult books. And I mean, mm -hmm. every book in the library. So romance was part of that. I mean, there was no African-American really mass market fiction back right. then other than the classics. And I grew up reading those also. So, you know, probably junior high school discovered Mary Stewart and Victoria Holt and, you know, all of the, 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 the basis for um, romance, American and English. But the history was something that I grew up with. You know, I told people my mom was black before it was fashionable. So <laughs> I grew up with African-American history in my home. So my writing journey, I wasn't planning on being a writer. You know, I just sort of stumbled into this. Um, all I ever wanted to do was work in a library. And so did I. I know. And so that, you know, the universe gave me that. And the romance that I was writing on, because who doesn't love a, a good love story? I was writing, you know, just for me. Uh, one of the women at work um, had been recently published and um, showed her the little mag manuscript that I was working on. And she was like, well, you need to get this published. And I'm like, yeah, right. Okay. So, but, you know, eventually we did. And I write historicals because that was the first thing that sold. So it was like, okay, well, you know, wrote this one. Um, 
maybe they wanted another one, then they wanted another one, and then they wanted another one. And so here we all are 26 years later. Uh, talking wow. about, um, you know, at the Brooklyn Book Fest. So, but you know, people talk about romance being formulaic. What genre is it? I right. mean, if you look at sci-fi, you look at Westerns. Mm -hmm. I mean, so true. Everybody's got their formula, everybody's got their own beats. But it's very, very difficult to write relationships. Mm -hmm. um, if it was an easy thing, the divorce rate would not be through the roof, right? <laughs> so we right. could have that conversation that we have in the books right. and in our relationships. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's like, you know, when I when I, you know, you get with people who say, well, you know, romance is this and romance is that. It's like, can you try and write one? You know, exactly. write one that people will take off their shelves when times are hard to just sort of ease into and, and change the day and how they feel about each other and all of that. So um, romance is big business because it is big business. It means a lot mm -hmm. to people, male and yeah. female. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I want to kind of segue a little bit to a little bit more serious topic. So while we all um, you know, write about, um, you know, relationships and the building of trust between people. I'd like each of you to talk just a little bit about how what is happening right now in our world is totally counter to the elements of a romance novel um, and how what you write can remind us about the importance of the human connection. So, um, Rochelle, could you speak on that a little bit? Now. Are you talking about the chaos that's going on? Are, you know, oh, can, yes. <laughs> can you be a little bit more specific? Yes. Yeah, so, like, what, what, we're sort of in this world of fiction. We couldn't make this stuff up, right? If we were writing, nobody would buy this story because it's too incredible to actually be real. But we are here in, um, you know, in this space. So, when you're writing, you all are ingrained in writing about people, about building trust and relationships, um, about connections. And so with all this going on now, um, just talk a little bit about how the elements of what you write are so counter to what is happening now and, and why what you do is so important. Well, someone did write about the chaos that's going on now, and that's Octavia Butler. Because mm -hmm. she, she was a science fiction writer, but she also was a futuristic writer because when she wrote Parable of the Sowers, and right. it was about, you know, apocalyptic in the United States, you know, like California, you know, they had the fires and people were living in enclaves and they had to hire guards to to keep the, the, the Raiders out, almost like a Mad Max type of thing. So, you know, she did write about that. Um, what's happening now is not that different from other times in this country when it was fractured. I mean, you look at post-Reconstruction. Yep. When you had the rise of the Klan and, and, and the Knight Riders and, and people burning black churches and, 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 I mean, killing black folk just because they were black. That, you know, this is not new. Just the fact, the fact it's being televised. Okay, that's what makes it so, so shocking to us. But you've had demonstrations, you've had race riots, you've had, I mean, this is not new. This is not new, but the thing is, what, you know, because someone, I was on a Facebook chat not too long ago, and someone asked me if I was going to write about the pandemic, mm. if I was going to include it in my book. And I said, no, I'm not. I said, because I don't know if somebody's reading that book and they've lost somebody in their family, and they don't want to re replay that or role play with that. I said, you know, that's, if I'm going to write about a pandemic, I'll write about the 1918 Spanish flu. But not with because that was a that that happened very differently. People were dying, but the root and the cause of it, it was very different than now. And the fact that because um, I've read about it's they said it started in a fort in Kansas, 
when they were burning waste materials. I don't know whether it was medical waste and the cloud just mushroomed all over that area. And then when the United States entered World War I, the troops went over. And that's mm -hmm. when it really spread throughout the world. I said, but today, I'm not going to write about that. Um, if I'm going to write a period piece, yes. I will write about the unrest. And we look at, um, you looked at the 19, 1968 Democratic Convention. I mean, and, you know, the civil rights era. This is not new. But, you know, like Gil Scott Heron said, the revolution will not be televised, but it is televised, Gil. It is okay? now, that's for sure. It, it, I was thinking televised. the same thing. So, um, you know, for us, it's like, oh, my God, this is horrible. You, you know, you have the demonstrations and you have the, you have this and then you have the police and this. It's not new. Yeah. I mean, 40 years ago, it was it was there. But yeah. because it's coming into your homes like 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 ballistic missiles just hitting you and hitting you and hitting you that, you know, when I sit down to write, I don't want I don't want to write live news cover coverage i don't want to do that and if you know and if somebody's going to read my books it's going to take them away from what's going on on that television screen for a couple of hours or for a couple of days depending upon the length of the book but yeah, um it goes back to that whole idea of um you know release and mm -hmm. looking for that comfort and that 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 happily ever after so um on on that uh, note um i i just want to find out because we are in this situation um and we have been um locked away from loved ones and friends and mm -hmm. um you know people have suffered loss of jobs family members, friends, et cetera. How are each of you keeping sane and safe? Um, and how does your writing help with that process, Beverly? Um, this is my, you know, I, I know that many people are struggling. I mean, people are struggling with the, the lockdown. People are struggling with the distance. But this is my life. You know, I'm, I'm, locked, mm -hmm. I'm locked down all the time. You know, I... You know, I've been having my groceries delivered for the last three years. So, you know, this is, you know, it's like, welcome to my world. But um, it has not affected, you know, yeah, I miss church. I miss, you know, seeing people. I miss going, you know, I miss a little bit, a little, a little bit of miss travel. You know, I'm traveling mm -hmm. all the time. So I miss that, seeing the readers. But it hasn't affected my writing because... There's chaos outside. I can mm. control what I write and I can control that world. And so that gives me the comfort of not letting it, you know, impact what I do because I get to control my world. So mm -hmm. I'm, you know, and, and I know, like I said, I know people are struggling, but for me, um, this is what I do. This is yeah. What I do. Yeah, you know, I, it's it's interesting that you should say that because, um, you know, as much as um, readers may think that writers are really very introverted and, you know, because we create these worlds and all of this, I'm good staying in my house. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm just pajamas from the waist down right now. So, yeah, not, not a problem. <laughs> not I don't a problem. have to go out. I don't have to do anything. I can talk to people. Just like you, Bev, like I have my groceries delivered. You know, Amazon is my best friend. Mm -hmm. So I'm good. But, you know, I know it's hard for, you know, for some folks. And um, so, Wayne, the, the, the same question to you, um, you know, how has, uh, what? Ha although in um, Barbados, uh, the, the crisis hasn't been as severe as it has been here in the United States, but you all, too, um, or doing the whole lockdown and isolation and things like that. So how has, um, how have you dealt with it? Um, and has it affected your writing in any way? Um, it has affected my writing in a way. Um, I think I'm writing more. Oh, okay. Ah, that's good. We, because I'm a high school teacher, most of my time is taken up with preparing classes. But one of the things that I've found now is because I'm 
teaching partly from our home and we have a hybrid system, teaching partly from home and teaching partly um, face to face at school, I am commuting less and I have more time to write. And I've been using the writing as therapy for me because it is helping me to focus on other things besides the pandemic. So I've been doing a lot more writing. Um, it's, it's interesting that we brought up the subject of um, the times, the 1960s. Um, I'm working, uh, uh, the current book I'm working on is a sequel to the series that I was a part of, the Decade series, where um, my book is set in the 1960s. Um, but I've been able to look at the 1960s it's actually set in 1968, just before, just before Martin Luther King's um, assassination. And I've been forcing myself to look at that time and looking at what exists now and the chaos that exists now and thinking that uh, more needs to be written about pe this time period. Um, more needs to be written about the 1920s and the 1930s. And I, I think it makes me validate what I did in relation to that series of books, because I wanted to show people the African-American experience in those decades. Mm -hmm. But what I also wanted to do was talk about the elements that make things bearable, like family yeah. and the unity and the determination and the drive that we all as black people have to make a life that's better for us. And even though unfortunately it's, we're in 2020 now and we are experiencing some of the same things oh, yeah. that are the, in the blacks from our past experience, I think we are, we are able to face them a little different because we have seen differently because we've seen how others handle it so we can add more to it. But I think, yes, the elements are important. The family, the unity, the togetherness, the determination. Um, and that to me, those things are, to me are really, really important. And that's why I want to write in my books, even though it, there may be some realistic sadness in what I write, I want to highlight those, those, those characteristics. Yeah, and, um, you know, just thinking about time periods um, that, you know, each of you have brought up and the um, the fact that what Rochelle was saying earlier about there's nothing new, you know, about what's happening. This has been happening to us for forever Ever. since we got here, right? right. So, but right. it wasn't until um, the late 80s that Black romance even saw the light of day. Right. Yeah. Even with all this going, because even right up to now, I was just thinking um, just before we started, you know, this is 2020 and we're still saying the first African-American fill in the blank. Right. You know, in 2020, we're still mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. So um, so since the doors have been open, of course, you know, a lot of things have changed since the first black romance. Um, but what impact has the black romance had on the industry and how reflective are they to what is happening in society? Um, so I really want to kind of talk, um, kind of focus a little bit on um, the, this whole diversity movement, because now we're the flavor of the month for now. Um, and, um, you know, there's, you know, there's diversity officers being put in every organization and they're trying to have imprints and they have to, language has to be correct. So with all of this diversity going on, um, is it going to make a major difference? Do you really think it's gonna make a difference or are we gonna just slide back to where we were before? What do you think Bev? You know, I, I tell people, I said, don't put me on any more diversity panels. I know, right? <laughs> you don't want to be the one. You know, because we've been screaming about this for how long? And uh -huh. it hasn't mattered. It has not mattered. We all know the, the RWA blow up and, you know, how they burn their shit down and all of that. <laughs> but I think that the independent 
black romance writers mm-hmm. have made a real um, caused a real effect on publishing in the sense that they were like, okay, you don't want my books. Gatekeepers got the gate locked. So they were like, okay, well, screw you. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to write my shit. I'm going to build this fan platform. And I'm going to make some money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then publishers are now saying, oh, oh. <laughs> um, don't you want to come and play in our sandbox too? Mm-hmm. You know? um, it has made them at least look mm-hmm. at what's been going on. Um, I'm looking at all of these CEOs who are being appointed, you know, in the last, you know, six weeks, we've had, you know, seven or eight black women, mm-hmm. you know, appointed as heads and like you said, diversity officers and all of that. Is it going to make a difference? I'm not going to hold my breath. Because, no. You know, we've, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm sick of talking about it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of every time I get an interview, somebody's asking me about RWA and the diversity. Mm-hmm. You know, give me something that, you know, anyway, it's yeah. frustrating. Let's put it that, and it's exhausting. Yes, it is extremely exhausting. And, you know, to your point, things don't really change that much, no matter what it, we would like it to, but just think about it. We said, put cameras on the cops, because if we see them filming stuff, they'll stop doing stuff to us. Nope. Nope. Don't make no difference. It doesn't make any difference that an entire crowd is filming your horrific behavior on their camera to come out to the world. It doesn't matter. Right. They do it anyway. Right. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's as you said, but it's, it's frustrating, um, you know, but we just got to kind of keep plowing ahead, you know. I, I mean, guess the one thing we could, the, the answer yeah. did not give up. You know, even, exactly. even with face with, you know, like Rochelle was talking about, the, the failure of reconstruction in 1876. Mm-hmm. They didn't stop. You know, they, 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 they dealt with the lemons. They built colleges. They, you know, raised kids. Mm-hmm. They formed businesses. And they loved. Mm-hmm. They loved mm-hmm. fiercely. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think is lacking from, I'm sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox here. Um, I think that's what's lacking in how America views us, because all they see is pain. I see mm-hmm. strength. I see cleverness. I see intelligence. And I see love. So yeah. I'm yeah. stepping down off my soapbox now. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, to, to, to sort of you know, highlight that is um, it's easier for them to see our pathologies. Right. As a, because as long as they can do that, we are mm-hmm. not human we are not valued you know um, because as soon as you can empathize right then it's a whole different situation and it it takes them out of their comfort zone and 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 that's part of the problem but that's a whole other you know what really bothers me when are we going to become just americans why is it always the first black American with this, the first this? We've been here for more than 400 years. I don't think any race of people could have survived what we went through and was still standing, and they still see us as competitors. Mm-hmm. You know, when, the, when they burned down the little black towns, because you became, you didn't need them, and they couldn't stand that because they looked at you as being inferior. And to this day, it bothers me when they talk about this woman is the first black CEO of this Fortune 500 company. Why can't she just be the first female? Why does she have to be? But when they label us, that makes that takes us out of the, the whole. It's always a little piece of the pie. Yeah. And it, and if we Well, the United we can, States is, is like the only the only country where and, your race is hyphenated with America. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like you don't go to China and you like, you know, the Taiwanese, Chinese, blah, blah, blah. No. You're not. It's you're only Chinese. here. You yeah. just Chinese, you're Chinese and that's but, it. But you but come here, you're such and such American. It's the only place that that happens because- It's um, deliberate. And, you know, 
it's, it's, it's very deliberate. deliberate. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's to it's to um, alienate, divide, and to keep people at a certain hierarchy as well. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. long as we can mm -hmm. put a label on you, we can figure mm -hmm. out where you belong. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so <laughs> back to the rock. <laughs> Mm. Oh. I mean, I'm going to get upset because we're romance writers. <laughs> we want to bring peace what? and love and all of that. <laughs> Publishers see us as currency. Okay. Yeah. They didn't want, mm. uh, originally, they didn't mm. want to publish us. Right. But then they decided, oh, wow. If yeah, when they realized right. Black writers were reading romance. And when they began reading their own romance, they're saying, oh, they looked at their bottom line. Oh, that's green. Mm -hmm. And that's, we've always been to them currency. Slavery was currency. Built yeah. this economy. Okay? And even if they tell us, oh, we want diversity, what they want is that black dollar because we have that, we, we can, we buy whatever we want. Yeah. You buy the yeah. best cars, the best liquor, okay? The finest clothes with the brands on it because they're styling. They know we will spend money. And I think a lot of times now they they want us because it's that it's that dollar. It's that bottom line. Yeah. We'll say, we saved Broadway. We saved sports. We saved TV at one time with, with, with all the, you know, the black shows. We have saved America from the very beginning. The there were 12 presidents that owned slaves. The economy was in the South. It was, they, that's where the riches were. And they, you know, when they tell you, oh, we want, we want diversity. No, you want, you want our money. Because you know, if I write for you, the people who buy me are coming along and put that money in your, in your coffers. I, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Well, <laughs> this is Sunday. So mm -hmm. everybody can preach, okay? Okay, thank um, you. We are um, coming up on another eight, nine minutes. Um, so I just wanna, I wanna pose individual questions for each of you. And then I have um, a final question about your upcoming projects. Um, so I wanna start with, um, with Bev. Um, you've been sort of like hailed as the um, historical romance writer of, you know, black historical romance writer, but you've also dipped your toes in women's fiction from time to time. So um, was the switch challenging in any way? And how did your readers respond? If you could answer that kind of quickly for me. Um, I've had my toes in a lot of stuff. Uh, the women's fiction series, Bring on the Blessings, I'm getting ready to do book 11. I've done romantic suspense, I've done YA historicals. Um, the readers, God bless them, have followed me. You know, yeah. they will follow me to Mars if, 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 if I ask. <laughs> I am blessed to have a great readership that also reads all of the ladies and gentlemen on this panel. So, you know, we all read each other. So I'm, I'm blessed and it wasn't difficult. It's also a way to clean my palate, to write mm -hmm. something, something besides historical. But I try and keep those elements of family, like as, as Wayne was speaking about, family and unity and excellence. Mm -hmm. in everything that I write. So that's my quick yeah. answer. Yeah, but I want to uh, just a quick follow up. Yes. Because you do historicals, there's no way in the world that you can just sit down and write a historical. Just when you know that, okay, book 11 is coming up, mm -hmm. how much prep in terms of your research would you be doing for a historical book just in general? It depends on if it's a subject that I'm familiar with. Okay. So the reconstruction is not going to be that much um, stuff. When I did the, uh, the Black people in the American Revolution, that took a minute because I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't know in depth. So it just depends on, on, on what the subject matter is and if I'm familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll give you a bib list in the back so that you don't have to do what I did and search through stuff. You can just go through my citations and my sources and, mm -hmm. and look at the history. So hopefully that answered what you wanted? Yes, thank okay. you so much. You're welcome. Um, and Wayne, um, you're like a handful of male romance writers. Um, and why was it important for you to launch Romance in Color? 
the website and review site. Talk a little bit about that before I get um, to it. I started um, Romance and Color in the late 19, in the late 1990s. Um, so it's quite old right now. When I started, the purpose was to, um, there were not, there were a lot of websites that reviewed white books, but no black books. And I remember me, Melanie Schuster, who's passed away, and I, we decided to start it. And we started, I remember it was just the two pinnacle books every month. Now, 10 to 20 books, we can't even keep up with it. But it was important to me because I wanted to bring a certain level of respectability to African-American romance. Um, and even now in 2020, I'm still very passionate and see myself as an advocate for black romance. And um, I think that's something I'll, I'll probably always do because I think that we have voices to be heard. And too, for too long, we have, as you said, played the ugly steps. I would say the ugly stepsister because that's how they see us. We are the ugly stepsisters of romance. And until there's us, yeah, the respectability is coming and we are seeing it, but it's the same thing how black people in general are treated. Yeah, there are some people who respect us and there are others who just see us as cash. Cash, mm -hmm. the cash cow, yeah. Well, yeah. we have exactly four minutes left. So I'm Rochelle. Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to ask you before I ask the panel their final, the final question is, um, I know you for your series and your readers know you for your different series. Um, your first series, um, up until now. So what is your most recent series? What is your most recent series now? What are you working on now? I'm working on, I'm, write, I'm writing for Special Edition and I'm mm -hmm. also writing for Kensington. Um, mm -hmm. Kensington is the book club series. The second book will be out in next May. Um, I'm, I'm, I haven't started the third one yet, but um, I just finished the 10 book series for Special Edition. It's the Wickham right. Falls Weddings. I mean, in, and now um, I've started a new one called The Bainbridge House. Okay. And that's right now, it's like four books. And I really don't want to run them that long, run them as long as I did the Hideaway series, which I think was Hideaway. 17. Yes, that's it. I mean, it's like you have a big house and mm. you have the family reunion and some, they, some people leave and some people want to stay. Oh, you got room. I said, okay, you can stay a little bit. And next thing they know, oh, you know, my, my boy wants to come over and hang out. And, he to, and then yeah. after a while you say, wait a minute, y'all got to go because y'all going to start claiming squatters rights, okay? <laughs> you got to go. And that's when I feel like I did, I think, eight books for the Eatons. I did three or four books for the, um, for the Blackstones. I did the Whitfield Brides. I did the Best Men. But you know what? If I can do three or four books, I'm good. But after yeah. that, yeah. it's just like you love these relatives, but send them home get rid of them and it, and it will always be in your memory as something good and that's how I feel about series yeah we have exactly two minutes I'm getting the the, the notice from our uh you know how they do at the Apollo and they start playing the music yeah. um so <laughs> starting to play the music in my ear um so I just want to find out from each of you um Beverly what is um what is your what is up for you um and how can readers find you New uh, historical coming out in <clears throat> February, Wild Rain. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me at my website, www.beverlyjenkins.net or off of Ms. Bab on Twitter. <laughs> All right. Uh, Wayne, what is next for you? Where can we I'm, touch you? I'm working on two books right now. I'm working on my first teen mystery series. Um, the first book is called uh, Clue in the Abandoned Lighthouse. And I'm hoping to have that out for Christmas. And then for um, um, Black History Month, I hope to have the sequel to Promise Me um, a Dream for, mm -hmm. I can't remember the title, but it has <laughs> Forever Dream um, to be out okay. in February. All right. And that's what Rochelle, what's next for you? I have a special edition. It's called A New Foundation. That's in April. I have the, be the Beach House uh, from Kensington in May. 
and I'm supposed to have the second Bainbridge house um, in December, which is a Christmas theme. And I'm not certain when the third book in the love, uh, the book club will be out. Okay. So, you know, I've got quite a little bit on my plate right now. Okay. Well, they can find Alice. me at www.rochellealice.org. Um, I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. So okay. I, don't do a lot, I don't do a lot of posting on social media, but I'm there. Okay. Thank you. And WayneJordan.net. WayneJordan.net. Yes. Okay. So we have hit our mark. I cannot thank you all enough for being here and spending time with us today. Um, I know that the folks that were listening, because we can't see who all is out there, um, I know that they enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Um, be well, stay safe, and hopefully we'll be able to see each other in Barbados with <laughs> Wayne. <laughs> Under you, are welcome, you are welcome, You are welcome. You are welcome. I told thank you, you I got family there. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for having us, Donna. And and Wayne and, and Bev, it's good to see you. Good to yeah, see everybody. Here. This is really good to see you. Yeah. Across the way. Stay safe, everybody. You too. Stay safe. Take right. care now. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.